So uh, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Beth Schumann. I'm the director of American Friends of Combatants for Peace. Uh, we're the American NGO that was founded to support and fund the uh, NGO in Israel and Palestine, Combatants for Peace. Uh, so for those of you who are new to us, Combatants for Peace is an organization of movement um, that has dedicated itself truly to the fight of racism. We stand up to all forms of bigotry, whether that be anti-Semitism in the case of the call tonight um, or anti-Arab and anti-Palestinian bias. We work on the ground in Israel and Palestine to end the occupation and to build bridges of understanding and respect between Jews and Palestinians um, and actively overcome racism on both sides. Um, so we're so pleased to welcome you to this discussion on anti-Semitism today. Um, in case you didn't know, um, today is, it's quite the anniversary. It marks the fourth anniversary of the white supremacist rally in Charlottesville, um, which was arguably one of the first really noticeable rises in hate in the United States in recent years. So um, a sad anniversary, but a timely event. Um, I'd like to introduce our two speakers of the night. Um, Nizar Farsak is a former member of the Palestinian negotiating team director of the Palestinian delegation in Washington, DC, and a frequent commentator on Palestinian affairs. He currently teaches negotiations at George Washington University, is chair of the board of the Museum of Palestinian People, and he also happens to be one of our board members. Um, and alongside him is the well-known Peter Beinhart, who I know you guys are all excited to see tonight, professor of journalism, and political science at um, City University of New York, editor at large of Jewish Currents, and a frequent contributor to the New York Times, a CNN political commentator, and a fellow at the Foundation for Middle East Peace. Uh, Peter also invites you to follow his blog and we'll put the link in the chat. So I do think it is important for us tonight to note that uh, for both of these speakers, their views are their own. Um, and they're here to represent themselves and their opinions. So you don't have to agree. This is just an opportunity to learn. Our goal today is to offer an engaged and in-depth conversation on this difficult topic. Um, we're holding this discussion in part because we see that often there's a lot of misunderstanding, controversy, um, tension about what anti-Semitism actually is. Um, so to start, I'd like to ask Peter, I'm gonna throw it to you. Peter, how do you define anti-Semitism and how and when do you separate it out from criticism of Israel and or the Israeli government and military policies? And you're muted. Uh, yes, um, uh, thank you. It's, so it's, uh, it's, um, it's wonderful to be with you. I'm a great admirer of um, Combatants for Peace. The definition of anti-Semitism I think is really pretty simple, it's, it's hostility or discrimination uh, against Jews as Jews, right? So if you don't like me because I'm Peter Beinart, that's not anti-Semitism. Um, but if you don't like me because I, I Peter Beinart, am a Jew, um, uh, then, then that may be anti-Semitism. Um, where things have become um, deeply controversial, uh, and this really goes back, I would say, to the 1970s, to something which was then described as the new anti-Semitism, has been an argument made by some uh, uh, supporters of, of the Israeli government that, um, that, um, that certain kinds of criticism of Israel become anti-Semitic. And there are two in particular that, um, for instance, if you look at the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism, that they give as examples of anti-Semitism. The first is what uh, Natan Sharansky called delegitimization, which is to say, Yes, you can criticize Israel without being anti-Semitic, but if you question the legitimacy of a Jewish state, that's anti-Semitic. You can't say that Israel should not exist as a Jewish state, that's anti-Semitic. Uh, I think that's wrong. Um, I think that um, if you think about, for instance, the experience of Palestinians, um, it's quite understandable that Palestinians would not want to live under a Jewish state. A Jewish state by its very nature privileges Jews over Palestinians. So for this, you know, just as most Jews wouldn't want to live in a, a state that privileged Christians over them uh, or Muslims over them, it's quite understandable to me that Palestinians would oppose a Jewish state. Now, some of them might oppose a Jewish state in ways that I 
deeply oppose, and some of them might do so in the name of a vision that itself I would consider, uh, you know, let's say Hamas's first charter, I think was an anti-Semitic document. But if you're a Palestinian who says, I don't want to live in a Jewish state. I want to live in a state that gives me equality, that gives Jews and Palestinians equality. One could disagree with that. You could say it's impractical. You can say whatever. But to say that that is anti-Semitic seems to me fundamentally wrong. If you say, as many uh, pro-Israel commentators do, that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, then you are essentially making almost all Palestinians anti-Semites, because almost all Palestinians, at least in my experience, are anti-Zionists. And given their experience with Zionism, right, a movement that was a movement that that you know that, that who, in whose name many Palestinians were expelled, denied basic rights, dominated, it's hardly surprising that they would be anti. A Zionist. And so that's one problem with this. The second argument that's often made is that it's anti-Semitic to treat Israel by double standards. If you are criticizing Israel more than it deserves to be criticized compared to those other countries in the world that are doing bad things, that, that's anti-Semitic. Now that seems to me deeply problematic for a number of reasons, right? It's not, there's not, no, no clearly, you have to say, okay, Israel is the 39th worst human rights abuser of, in the world, and therefore I'm gonna allocate my time. That's not how things work. People are attract, people are moved by all kinds of different causes and give disproportionate attention to those causes for a whole set of reasons, right? So to give, let's give two examples of situations where you could, I think, rightly accuse people of double standards. The first was when American Jews boycotted the Bolshoi Ballet in the 1970s because the Soviet Union was oppressing Jews. That was an example of double standards. The Soviet Union's treatment of Jews was bad, but it wasn't the worst human rights abuse in the world. It wasn't as bad as the Khmer Rouge committing genocide, right? So was it anti-Soviet? No, it's just that this group of people had a particular concern. And much of the focus of criticism of Israel is in response to Palestinian concerns. The anti-apartheid movement could also have been accused of double standards, since the apartheid South Africa, again, was not probably the world's worst human rights abuser. Generally, I think we take the view that if there is something fundamentally wrong that's going on, and you take an action, uh, and, and to criticism in order to write that, we generally think that's a good thing, even if there are other worse things in the world that you may not be focusing on. So if you're concerned about saving the whales, um, and that's not as important as uh, you know, the lack of health care in America, we don't say that, that you're doing something wrong. We just say, we, we say that this is something that you happen to be care about, and we look at it on its merits. So to me, the double standard argument is also misguided. And these are two ways in which I think that anti-Semitism gets weaponized to try to prevent criticism of Israel or challenges to the notion of Jewish supremacy over Palestinians in ways that I don't actually think help the real fight against anti-Semitism. Um, uh, uh, Nizar, let me let me uh, let me uh, turn it turn it over to you. I, I I'd I'd uh, love to hear you talk about what it's been like for you to. Um, uh, engage with this question of anti-Semitism as a Palestinian? Sure. So, I mean, as a, uh, first, thank you guys for having me on this talk. Uh, definitely, I've had my own uh, experience uh, as a Palestinian, a diaspora Palestinian. Um, we were brought up to differentiate between Judaism and Zionism. We always used to say, like our parents would tell us, uh, we're not against Judaism as a religion, we're against Zionism as a political uh, ideology right uh, so that was a distinction that was uh, that we were brought up to to learn that uh, Jews lived in Palestine with Christians and Muslims my father had Jewish neighbors when he was living in Jerusalem um, so in general yes the Arabs and Muslims and, and, and Palestinians view the issue of anti-semitism as a European problem uh, and as it partakes to the Palestinian Israeli conflict they do see it as um, an excuse to dispossess the Palestinians. Like, if if Europeans are racist, why should we pay the price of European racism, right? And it stops at that. Nobody actually goes into a conversation of whether uh, Arab Jews were happy living in Arab countries um, and stories of, uh, you know, um, Jews of uh, Eastern extraction in Israel, Israeli Jews who are of Eastern extraction who long for the times they lived in Iraq or other places, these stories are usually overblown and exaggerated in, in Arab media uh, to, cry, to, to 
to disqualify um, uh, the problem of anti-Semitism. Of course, the other thing that is important to explain to people is, in general, there, there is also this um, defense that's, of course, not a defense, it's just a deflection, that technically speaking, Arabs and Jews, and in fact, Arabic and Hebrew are Semitic languages. So you would hear somebody say, well, I cannot be anti-Semitic if I myself is a Semite, right? So, sure, the more accurate term would be anti-Jewish sentiment. And there, there is an argument to be made that, in fact, the word anti-Semitic in and of itself is racist European Christian uh, terminology. Uh, but regardless, the point is uh, uh, discrimination against Jews and discrimination for being Jewish or for the perception of being Jewish also, right? The same way that you had, uh, uh, you know, Sikh, uh, Sikhs who were attacked because people thought that they were Muslim, right? So it's, it's this, the fact that you have an attribute uh, of being Jewish and therefore you're being discriminated, that is just, uh, that that is racism, right? Um, now, uh, I'll stop at that. <laughs> um, yeah, I, and I think that um, Nizar, you're putting your your finger on something that I I often notice is a really fundamental distinction, often between the way I see Palestinians um, talking about the Jewish experience and the way many Jews, not all, but many Jews, talk about the Jewish experience. Um, which is that I've often heard Palestinians say. Um, relations were good before Zionism, some version of this, and often in personal terms, you know, as you did, we had Jewish neighbors, you know, we had no problem with them, you know, we all got along. And then this movement came from Europe and Zionism was a movement that was that was really largely found in Europe, although there were there were some early Zionists in uh, in parts of the Arab world, but mostly it was a it was a, a Zionist uh, a European movement it came out of European nationalism and European anti Semitism, and the Palestinian view is Things were fine here, generally, um, and, um, and then Zionism came and really screwed it up. Um, um, I think very frequently, um, the Jewish narrative tends to be something more on the, along the lines of um, when Jews did not have a state and Jews were relatively powerless, they were always in danger. Um, and um, yes, maybe that danger culminated in its most extreme form uh, in, in Europe in the Holocaust. Um, but Jews uh, were not also equally, uh, Jews did not have equality and true safety in the Arab world either. There were, uh, you know, there were anti-Jewish attacks in those places as well. And, and after all, look, all of the Jews, uh, so many of the Jews had to flee um, uh, from these Arab countries um, and come to Israel, or, or many of them came to Israel. So if things had been so good for them, why would they not have been able to, you know, why did people turn on them in Iraq and Morocco and these other places? So I think these are two really fundamentally different, different narratives. And um, I, uh, I, I think it's um, one of the, uh, I, think, I think the challenge, um, uh, I think the challenge for Jews is to, um, is to, is to, is to recognize, is to, is to chat is to recognize that um, that uh, um, things may not have been uh, I I idyllic for Jews uh, in the Middle East, um, but also to avoid the notion, which is I think sometimes inherent in sometimes the way Jews can talk about Jewish history, that essentially every new that that, that the Palestinians simply represent uh, the new kind of eternal enemy of the Jewish people, going back to you know Amalek or Esau and then running through the Nazis and now it's the Palestinians, which ultimately is a way I think of, of a, is a deeply dehumanizing narrative that makes it impossible for Palestinians to actually speak in their, in their own voice. Um, uh, so I, I'm, I'm, uh, I see we have, a, we have a, a question about the difference between anti-Semitism and um, uh, racism. Uh, Niza, I don't know if you wanna talk about that or if you wanna talk about the, the ways in which you think um, uh, anti-Semitism uh, has been an issue even in in the Arab world, despite you know the very different experience that you know that 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 Jews have had in Europe. Uh, sure. Well, uh, I will turn it back to you. But the one thing I would say here is definitely it doesn't serve the cause of fighting anti-Semitism to equate all sorts of anti-Semitism, right? Mm -hmm. So um, definitely. Uh, 
while there were anti-Jewish sentiments in the Arab world and the Muslim world, they were different from the ones in Europe, uh, but you had just as much anti-Christian, anti-Baha'i, anti, uh, any minority had suffered in a majority country all the time, right? And uh, again, a, a, a deflection that Arabs and Muslims in general use is saying how, for example, the, the, that there was a lot of tolerance in the Arab world. In fact, when there was the, the Inquisition in Spain, the Jews came to the Muslim world. Uh, when there were pogroms in Europe, the Jews came to Istanbul, to the Ottoman Empire, right? Uh, Salah al-Din's doctor was a Jew, uh, Maimonides, right? So they, they quote all of these things. Now, the fact that anti-Jewish sentiment or uh, 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 Jewish attacks were far less in the Arab and Muslim world than in Europe does not answer the question of where does a Jew feel safe and self-actualized, right? Um, so, uh, and because ever since the creation of Israel or ever since the engagement with Zionism, so basically 1917, mo mostly the Balfour Declaration, right? Um, it became an issue because there was this argument of the need for a nation for the Jews, right? So Arabs in general were against the idea of partition altogether, that we always had minorities, we always had all sorts of religions. There is no need to carve out a territory for one uh, uh, you know, sect or religion. Um, so ever since Israel was created, anti-Semitism and anti-Israel sentiment got, got mixed together, right? Now, of course, people would deflect anti-Semitism into saying, no, we're just anti-Israel, but that did not stop anti-Semitic attacks and anti-Semitic like, uh, TV shows and what have you, where the, uh, the, 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 um, the narrative changed from, we're differentiating between Jews and Zionists into bringing uh, 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 explanations from the Old Testament and that Israel is behaving this way because of their Jewish faith. And that is mostly a fundamentalist explanation, right? So Hamas and others would explain it that way, but that's an, ex an attempt from Arabs and Muslims to explain how come uh, the Israelis, the Israeli Jews behave in that way. So that conflation is important to understand as well as its uh, political uh, uh, utility, right? Now, um, What's, what would be interesting for us to discuss is your personal story. For, for you, since you, I know that you are of South African extraction, right? So how did, how, what was your encounter with racism and anti-Semitism personally? And how did you see the connection between the two? Mm. Um, thanks, thank you. I mean, I, I, the, um, it's it's interesting, you know. My my um, my parents are both South African, and um, the South African Jewish community um, was a community of people, uh, many of whom felt that they were in South Africa by a kind of an accident. You know, they they are they were largely Lithuanian descent, but they could have quite have easily ended up in the United States or Canada. They happened to end up in South Africa, and they ended up in this place that then was in this. Titanic conflict between a, a white oppressive regime uh, and a black majority that was struggling for basic rights and equality. Um, and they were offered this kind of um, bargain that they would be considered white, but by a regime of Afrikaners that had been often quite sympathetic to the Nazis. Um, so the Jews interpreted that as a kind of a, a, a conditional acceptance with an implied threat. So the conditional acceptance with the applied threat was don't be a traitor to us. You've been, you're accepted as white. Don't be a traitor um, because then we'll notice that you're Jewish um, and our anti-Semitism will come to the fore. And, and when I was growing up, I, I very frequently heard people talk in these terms. They would say, listen, we're passing through here. We're here for a, in South Africa. Um, our, um, we have to keep our heads down uh, because the Afrikaners don't really like us. And, um, and the blacks are, you know, we, we don't really have that much of a connection to them anyway. And our emotional loyalty, our connection is to Israel. That's where our heart is, um, even if we're not there physically. Um, and, and so, be, and because there was not a strong nationalist identity among South African Jews, that, that got transferred on to, to Israel, which I think is something you tend to see uh, in, in smaller diaspora communities, especially where the state is a little bit less uh, 
uh, is less appealing than it is in the United States, where it's easier to feel yourself an American. Um, and one of the, so one of the things that I think I began to think about growing up was the way in this, this became a kind of a moral evasion, a way of saying, um, because our concern is only for what's happening in Israel, we're not responsible for what's happening in South Africa. Um, and what was also troubling for me to try to make sense of was that those South African Jews, that minority, who really did dedicate themselves to fighting apartheid, and there were very, Jews who were very powerful in the African National Congress, like Joe Slovo, who led the ANC's military wing, themselves tended not to be Zionists and sometimes actually to be quite over anti-Zionist in contrast to the large bulk of the Jewish community. And that was, that was confusing to me. Um, uh, it didn't really seem to me, uh, uh, and I think it was only much later when I started to myself spend some time with Palestinians in the West Bank that I began to understand, and it was a very, very difficult and troubling thing to start to grapple with, um, um, the ways in which people could see analogies between apartheid South Africa and the situation that Palestinians were facing. Um, and, um, uh, and, and, and I think where I've ended up through all of this is, um, is, the, is this feeling that um, to use uh, Jew threats against Jews or the fear of anti-Semitism as a way of saying, we therefore don't have moral obligations to anybody else other than Jews. We don't have moral obligations to Black South Africans. We certainly don't have moral obligations to Palestinians, since after all, it's after Palestinians that we need to keep down in order to make sure that we are safe. I ultimately, although I think one can understand where this perspective comes from, given Jewish history, I ultimately think it's not only immoral, but ultimately self-defeating. That I ultimately don't think in the medium or long term that Jewish safety is well protected at the expense of other people. And that's what makes me so disturbed about the current discourse about anti-Semitism that you see in much of the American Jewish establishment. Because what it is, is a way of defining anti-Semitism that essentially labels almost all Palestinians as anti-Semites and becomes a way of making it almost impossible for Palestinians to actually speak without being branded as anti-Semite. So it becomes, ironically, in the name of fighting against bigotry, it becomes a way of actually perpetuating anti-Palestinian bigotry. It becomes a way of preventing a legitimate conversation about the fact that Israel denies Palestinians basic rights. And that seems to me to be fundamentally ethically and all strategically wrong, which it seems to me that I believe ultimately that we are the best defense against anti-Semitism is to situate anti-Semitism as part of a broader struggle against all forms of racism and discrimination, which has to include anti-Palestinian racism and discrimination. Um, but I'd, I'd love to know how you experience uh, this, this, uh, this debate about, about anti-Semitism as a Palestinian and how it affects your ability to engage with critiques of Israel. So my, my, my first personal encounter was, in fact, I, I, I was a Palestinian who was born and raised in Dubai to a Palestinian father, but an Italian mother. And I remember I was probably eight or nine visiting my, my cousins in Italy. And um, well, they were my second cousins, but anyways. Uh, uh, I don't know what brought the issue. And my cousin was like probably five years older than me. And he was having this political debate with me why do you guys don't just leave the Jews alone? I was like, where is this coming from, right? I came from a house and I was living in, in Dubai. All I knew was that we were the victims and the Israelis were the uh, uh, aggressors, right? And this Italian Catholic, you know, who's a cousin of mine, feels really strongly about uh, the Jews and he feels that I personally am persecuting them, right? So that realization, that, that dissonance really shocked me. Um, a few years later, um, when I went to college in, in Beirut, in Lebanon, of course, I've heard of, you know, uh, I, I had an uncle who had fought with the PLO in Lebanon. I've heard, of course, of all sorts of uh, horror stories. Of course, the Sabra Ishatila massacre. So, of course, we grew up with all of these stories and what have you. But then when I went there and I, I studied there in, in, in Beirut, 
I got to learn more stories. I had a lot of Lebanese friends who told me about atrocities that the Palestinians committed, right? And when I talked to my, my, my relatives who were refugees in refugee camps in, in, in Lebanon, it dawned to me that it didn't even occur to them that they as Palestinian refugees could do wrong, right? Because they're victims, right? So when I tell them about certain massacres that the PLO uh, contributed uh, in, in, the, in the civil war in Lebanon, they literally could not comprehend what I was talking about. They could not see themselves as Palestinian refugees as aggressors. And that was my entry point into understanding Zionism and understanding uh, the question that we ask ourselves as Palestinians, how could Holocaust survivors commit massacres, right? Like how could they kick us out from our houses when they were kicked out of their houses? They know what it's like. So, so that is what's unforgivable from the Palestinian perspective of it's the Europeans that kicked you out. Why, why are we paying the price? And, 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 the, and the challenge in, in engaging anti-Semitism is this, um, the, the more you live there, because I lived in, in Palestine for 10 years, I realized there are no Israelis that think that the Palestinians have it easy. They know that Palestinians have it hard. It's the, the, the argument is, yes, the Palestinians have it hard, but it's either this or the Holocaust. There's this false dichotomy that gets thrown at us. And it, it sucks to be you, but I mean, we're not gonna have another Holocaust. So you have 22 other Arab countries, just go there. Uh, this, you have Mecca. Jerusalem is more central to us than it is to you, right? All of these arguments that have nothing to do with our experience of, well, we lived here. I mean, we have the keys to the actual houses, right? Uh, and that's, that's when it gets tricky because it, it, it deals with issue of identity and history. But even if you leave all of that out, it goes back to your point, which is we happen, we happen to have what, 14 million people between the river and the sea, right? I came to my own conclusion that they're not going back to Poland. It's just, they're not. It sucks, but they're not going back to Poland, right? But I came to that. There are many Arabs, many Muslims, and many Palestinians who think that it, it is going to happen and that Jews are going to go back to Poland. Um, I, because of the interactions I've had and because of a variety of, 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 um, of experiences, including combatants, right? Like I, I realized, I cannot be more Palestinian than Suli, who was, you know, a, a Palestinian who uh, was jailed because of his activity in the Intifada, and here he is trying to create a future with Israeli Jews who were his jailers. Right? That that causes me pause. The fact that many of uh, you know Palestinians who were in Israeli jails were supported by Israeli Jewish lawyers like Liat Seimel and uh, Michael Woskowski, and that. The, 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 uh, our ability as Palestinians to be able to you know, remove the wall from a certain town was thanks to an Israeli lawyer, uh, uh, Sfard, right? And so on and so forth. So, so what I, my personal journey has been that the fight is really not between Palestinians and uh, uh, between Arabs and Jews. It really is between those who feel that they have exclusive rights and superior rights to others versus those who believe that we are equal as human beings, and uh, we would be uh, uh, hypocritical if we allowed ourselves rights more than the one in front of us, than the person in front of us. And it boils down to that. So long as there is, and this is something actually I learned uh, like the hard way, but I learned that my defensive, uh, defensiveness towards Zionism um, is ill-advised. It's not my problem. Zionism, does not, the way it's defined today doesn't work. If, if any person of any, uh, any person that can prove that they have one Jewish grandparent can come to Israel and get an Israeli citizenship and live in a settlement on land that was my grandfather's land, while my father who was born and raised in 1934 in Palestine needs the permit of a recent uh, a Russian immigrant who happens to be Jewish, that equation, that law, which is the, the law of return, Israel's law of return, doesn't work for me. If, if Zionists can come up with a version of Zionism uh, that allows me full safety and full self-expression, great, I, I would be the first Zionist. But this version of Zionism isn't working for me. So as far as your experience, 
What was your encounter? You had a, you have, you have, I mean, you've encountered Zionism, you've encountered Judaism, and you've encountered Israel, and then you've encountered Palestinians. How were these encounters, and what was your evolution of understanding uh, 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 what being Jewish uh, uh, means to you, and what is anti-Semitism to you? I, I'm sure it evolved with you. Yeah, there's a there's a lot there. I mean, I think. Um... I think the first thing that, that's important to say that uh, is that um, if that the connection to uh, what Jews call the land of Israel um, permeates so much of Judaism um, that um, anyone who is engaged with Jewish practice in in anything more than just the most cursory way will experience it all the time, right? So I literally pray multiple times a day prayers that, that talk about returning Jews to, to, to Jerusalem, to rebuilding the temples. And so I think that um, one of the, I think, uh, challenges um, in, the, in the discourse is that I think that um, there's a desire among many Israeli Jews and many diaspora Jews, and I, I suppose I, I feel this too, to want Palestinians to recognize that um, we too are indigenous, not in the same way as Palestinians, certainly, right? I mean, you're not, it's not the same if you, um, but that it's not, um, but it's not, it's not the same as the French in Algeria or the British in, uh, in Kenya. Um, and now one can go down an entire rabbit hole with people like Shlomo Sand and trying to figure out, you know, do the DNA testing. But in a way, I almost feel like in a certain kind of sense, it's beside the point. The, the, what is incontestable is that for 2000 years, there was at the center of Jewish civilization, whether Jews were in North Africa or Eastern Europe or wherever, this notion of a homeland. Um, and so I think there is a deep yearning among many uh, Jews to have Palestinians acknowledge that. Um, and yet I think that in my mind, the, the problem is that, um, you, it is. It may be real. It may be reasonable to ask Palestinians to acknowledge that, but not if acknowledging that means that therefore they are don't they are submit to being anything other than equal citizens with the same rights as Jews, right? Um, and I think that's so. These things need to be disentangled. Um, and I think part of the problem is that. Um, uh, you know, B'Tselem in its report uh, recently, which talks about the idea of, of apartheid, uses this very provocative, but I also think important phrase, Jewish supremacy, um, which is that it, des it, descri it describes Israel as a place in which Jews are legally supreme over Palestinians, not just in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, but in Israel proper itself through, as you say, immigration policy, also through land policy. And I think part of the problem in the in the in, in a lot of Jewish discourse is people that there's an almost there's an assumption that if that supremacy is gone, then Jews become powerless, as you say, right? Then you know, then Jews risk annihilation, you know. And I, I noticed this personally too, because when I called for um, a, a state, uh, you know, what some Palestinians have called a state for all its citizens, a state, a state in which everybody is equal, that the language that that is, the way that's de defined often in, in a lot of Jewish discourse is that I'm calling for the extermination of Israel, the annihilation of Israel, the destruction of Israel, I don't want Israel to have the right to exist, right, you see, all of these are terms that, whether consciously or unconsciously, right, raise the specter of tremendous violence, if not genocide, right, and again, for for Jews, given our trauma, it doesn't take much to inflame that, right? And so the irony becomes that the notion of equality is imagined as violence, right? Where, whereas the notion of denying people equal rights, right, that is actually violence, right? When you deny people equal rights, that is the form of violence. And yet I think oftentimes in a lot of the, uh, the, the American and Israeli Jewish conversation, it's very difficult to, hard for people to imagine that giving up on supremacy and privilege does not automatically lead to powerlessness and domination, right? That there is something in between those things. It's the ideal that we strive for in the United States, that most of us claim to actually believe 
certainly, which is the vision of equality under the law, right? In which you are neither supreme, but neither are you dominated and subjugated. You are equal. Um, and I think that um, that discourse, I think uh, in, the Jewish, in, in the Jewish community remains very underdeveloped. And so even when I tend to sketch it out, people's response will be, the most charitable response will often be, well, gosh, that's deeply, deeply naive, isn't it? I mean, don't you know anything about Palestinians? If you knew anything about Palestinians, you would surely know that Palestinians will take any opportunity they get if there's no longer the hard shell of a Jewish state to dominate, if not massacre, uh, Jews, you know, and, and, and it's, it's often almost seen as self-evident that that would be the case, right? Um, and it's, I have to say, personally, it's very frustrating to me to hear this all the time, because I want to often say to these people who are saying this to me about my deep naivete of the Palestinians, I want to say, listen, I don't claim to be the greatest scholar of Palestinian politics and culture in the world. I, I'm unfortunately, I do not speak Arabic, but I actually do read a lot of Palestinian writings, and I inter, I engage with Palestinians almost every day, how, much pal how many books by Palestinians have you read? You know, what's, wh on what is this basis that you have that you're so confident that Palestinians have this just inherent desire to kill Jews given the first opportunity? You know, it seems to me there's, a, there's an unconscious racism which underlies a lot of this discourse that is not even often brought to the surface. So, I feel like that's the way I, I tend to think about this question. And I also, I wonder what it's like for you, but it also seems to me in a way what Jews are asking of Palestinians is in a certain sense, which is something impossible, which is they're asking Palestinians to give them an ironclad guarantee that if they, uh, that, that, that if, they if, if, if they were to extend an offer of equality, that Palestine, that then then Jews would be still be safe, right? Um, and yet it seems to me that there's when you deny people basic rights, those people who are denied basic rights in some ways are not actually even really in the position to to respond to your fears. They can only people can only answer those fears when they're actually given the ability to actually express themselves as equals, right? If you have your foot foot on someone's you know on someone's chest, right, and you're saying promise me, promise me, promise me, right? It doesn't really work, whether you're talking about white versus black Americans or any other context. So anyway, I'm, I'm just, I'd be love to know how, how you think, I'm sure you, how you think about that discourse and how you engage with it. Definitely, it's, it's about what you said, right? Like it's, it's um, of course you're taking a risk. Somebody who's in power, who's gonna relinquish that power is taking a risk. The question is, is their power sustainable? And what, what you touched upon is important, which is um, both people are traumatized, right? So there is a lot of, um, I don't wanna call it irrational, right? But mm. the experience of pain, the experience of genuine existential fear is real, right? So when you're in that state of fight or flight, your reasoning is different. A lot of things become justified. The classical case is that all, Killing in general is uh, is forbidden in all religions except in self defense, right? Yeah, yeah. So th the fact that your personal you are personally under threat changes the rules, right? So Palestinians and Israelis have been living this trauma for a very long time, right? And so it's hard for the people, and I do empathize because I I've lived I was outside I lived there for ten years and now I'm I chose to stay outside, right? And I know there's a lot of privilege for me. Seeing, sitting here and talking, right? So, um, and that's why I'm in awe of people like Combatants for Peace who despite their pain, losing actual brother being killed in front of them and still working with the other, right? Which for me speaks to the truth of, of peace, that it is possible, but it does take courage and does take leadership. Now, in this trauma, you, you cannot rationalize. If, if the 2000 year experience of Jews has been it never worked for us when we were in a minority and under the mercy of some other majority or ruler, whether it is uh, Salah al din or if it was uh, the Dreyfus case, right? It, it, Herzl himself was an assimilationist yes. until the Dreyfus case, yes. right? Uh, so, so much for the French Revolution, right? And, and, right? and the same with the United States. In right. theory, people right. are equal. African-Americans right. continue to be discriminated against. The law makes them equal and there's still, still discrimination, right? So that is culture. And 
similarly between Jewish Israelis and, and white Americans, they know <laughs> that there is transgression and they, they are correct to not believe the oppressed that they will not seek revenge. Mm -hmm. There's, I, I, don't, I don't know if you know it, but the, one of the really poignant uh, uh, um, statements I read in South Africa when I visited, there was this woman who uh, her, her son was abducted by the Afrikaners, or are, I'm not sure if the Afrikaners or the police. Anyways, he was tortured and, and burned and killed. And in the, in the Truth Commission, she said, um, forgiveness is my waiving my right for revenge. That I have the right for revenge, but I'm choosing not to use it, right? And that is, I, I felt that that really spoke to me, right? Because when, when uh, especially when we think of the right of return and what have you, right? Like, when Israelis are asking Palestinians to recognize Israel as a Jewish state, when they are asking Palestinians to renounce the right of return, right? You are asking me to acknowledge that I am less human than you or I have less rights than you. I understand that Jews have had a horrible 2000 experience and it's understandable that they would be extremely skeptical, especially like I'm, I'm, what's occurring to me is the scene in, in the movie, The Pianist. And you know, it's a true story, right? When, when his parents, get so excited, oh, the, the, the British uh, are joining the war and, and they thought that they were safe, right? Th that, that naivete, right? That speaks to me, right? The fact that uh, you really cannot trust. If you, ha you have had that experience, you really cannot trust. Or my mentor, uh, Professor Ron Heifetz at, at the Kennedy School, right? He's Jewish, right? And he's a Zionist. And he speaks about his family's story who, who are Jews who, uh, from the Ukraine before the Second World War, but there was you know, uh, anti-Semitism in, in the Ukraine in their small village. And his great grandmother uh, was, uh, you know, a, 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 a strong woman. Uh, there was an incident that happened to one of the uncles and she said, no, that's it, we're leaving. And all the family said, no, what are you you're exaggerating? This is just one incident and so on and so forth. Make the long story short, that branch of the family who came to the States are the only ones that are left. Everybody else, literally, the whole family, got either killed in, in the Ukraine or killed in the Holocaust, right? So you can understand that if that's your experience, that it was just the stubbornness of one very big skeptic that had very little faith in humanity uh, that's literally saved the life, you can understand where that's coming from. Now, having said that, the Palestinians are burdened with all that history, right? We're the victims of the victims, right? So how do you, how do you square that? Now, of course, you, you can understand the fantasization of getting rid of the other. Uh, and I'll end with this, uh, but there's difference between fantasy and practically what you do. I, I was uh, running this uh, training with a group of Palestinians and Israelis. Uh, we, we got them to Northern Ireland to look at the Northern Irish case and, and see the lessons learned because you learn more when you look at somebody else's problem, right? It becomes easier because you're not invested and you see the dysfunctionality at any rate, it wasn't easy because we, we heard a lot of very difficult stories. Um, on the fourth day, we were having a conversation and, and, and running a, a session. And um, we were getting nowhere in, in, in the conversation. And a, a Jewish person, a Jewish Israeli, was talking to the, to the Palestinian next to him uh, and whispering. I told him, no, please share with the group. I'm sure that what you have to say is something that is important. He says, you know what? The reality of the conversation is we the Israelis would love for you Palestinians to, to disappear. And the Palestinians are saying, you know what? We would love for you Israelis to just effing disappear, right? Mm -hmm. That's the reality. It would be so much easier if you just, dis they, we don't care how you disappear, just disappear because you're a problem, right? And that's the reality. Now, the question is, what do you do? Can you live with yourself knowing that you've exercised your right of self-determination at the expense of the other. To, I tell a lot of my Palestinian friends, it's not so paradoxical that we, the Palestinians, are now a majority between the river and the sea. And we are today uh, in the same position that the Zionists were in the 1930s and 40s, where we know that we have a right to self-determination. Mm -hmm. The question is, are we willing to exercise our right of self-determination at the expense of the other, right? Of course, we have rights, but do we have rights instead of the other? That's the question. And that's, that's the question nobody wants to ask, whether Jew or, or Palestinian. And, and, 
And that's why I'm, I'm interested in, again, your experience in, you had a notion of what it means to be Jewish and what it means to be a Zionist and what it means to, be, to, to love Israel. And then you had different encounters with that. How was that for you? Yeah, and I also see, we, you know, we're getting a question uh, from someone who doesn't think that we have, I guess, sufficiently um, denounced anti-Semitism. And I, I, I mean, I, I guess, you know, perhaps it's hard for me to entirely know how to understand this question. For me, it seems to me, I would think it, you know, I find it self-evident that that I that I um, I am opposed to anti-Semitism. I mean, I, I, um, uh, I, you know, my children go to a Jewish day school. I I walk down the street uh, virtually every day wearing a kippah. If if there are people who want to attack Jews um, uh, as Jews, um, you know, I'm a very easy target. So um, uh, it seems to me kind of self-evident, and I think that part of the um, I think the real debate in the Jewish community is really not about whether one wants to battle anti-Semitism, it's about how we define anti-Semitism and what the right way to do that is. And, and I think the, 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 the question really, you know, there's this narrative that I think these are, you've captured very well, which essentially says the lesson of Jewish history, and I will say, I heard this from my own grandmother, you know, um, who I love very much, had a huge influence on me, but I, this was, you know, she grew up in Alexandria, Egypt, and then uh, was in the Belgian Congo and then and moved to South Africa and, and to move in many in, in various ways. And her ancestral community from the Isle of Rhodes was destroyed in the Holocaust. And she had this view that essentially it was not really, um, Jews didn't have the luxury of worrying about other people. Um, I, um, I, I, I think most Jews have probably heard that and probably from someone they love at some point in their life. Um, the reason uh, that it's some, that I've, the, it feels to me fundamentally wrong as an interpretation is, is twofold. First of all, um, uh, Jews are not simply a tribe. We, we actually have an ethical tradition. Um, um, and that ethical tradition speaks in many voices. Um, um, but um, in many, many different ways, it, it says that um, uh, Jews are not the only people in the world who matter, who, have, who, who, who deserve human dignity. The Torah does not start with Jews. Um, the first people in, in Torah, in the, in the Hebrew Bible, Adam, Eve, Noah, um, others are not Jews. They're universal human beings, right? Which I think is a, is a way of affirming the centrality of human dignity, irrespective of one's race and religion. Um, and, um, and I think that there is, it's, you know, many, many, many Jews suffered through the Holocaust and the anti-Semitism of the 20th century. There was not a consensus among those Jews who did that about Zionism. Right? There was a very, very robust debate about various different ways of responding to the Jewish, uh, to the Jewish conundrum. And, and I think that um, ultimately it seems to me that um, the, the, if you understand that um, denying people basic rights is a form of violence, and I think this is something that I did not really understand very well until I went and spent time on the West Bank myself and just saw how people's daily lives were, 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 how people were brutalized in so many different ways, big and small, by living without basic rights. And it doesn't have anything to do with the fact that Israeli Jews are bad people. It's simply inherent in the nature of a state. If, you, if a state is not accountable to you because you are not a citizen of it, because you can't vote for it, then that state will do terrible things to you. The only thing that restrains a states from being brutal is when people have rights vis-a-vis -vis the state. If people don't have those rights, no rights in the West Bank or, even, or not equal rights even inside Israel, then they will be victimized by the state just in the same way that Black Americans were. That came through to me and then I began, um, and then it began to I began to think, is it really such a smart bet to believe that um, that the power balance will always be the way it is, right? So that 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 Palestinians can suffer all this violence, um, but Jews will simply assume that Jews will remain on top for you know forever, and therefore it really won't matter what's happening to Palestinians. Or as you say, maybe at some point even Palestinians will ultimately be gotten rid of. Um, that seems to me ultimately, you know, the history things go up and things go down, right? And it seems to me ultimately it's simply I think foolhardy to believe that when you live in close proximity to people that your safety in, in the long term is best secured by, by, by inflicting violence on those people. And 
one of the things that has inspired me the most is the story of those Jews who were able to take their experience of anti-Semitism and then respond to it, not by saying, I don't have obligations to Palestinians, but by saying, I want to treat Palestinians in the way that I wish I had been treated. So mm -hmm. there's a book, Nizar, you may be familiar with it, this interesting book of essays by, edited by Bashir Bashir and Amos Goldberg on the Nakba and the Holocaust. And one of the essays in this book is about uh, a, cup, uh, a couple that uh, escapes uh, the Holocaust after being in concentration camps. Their last name is, is, last name is Kowalski. Um, and they arrive in, 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 um, in, uh, in 1948. And they're in a they're in a camp. They're basically in a transit camp. And one day someone comes and says, it's your lucky day. We have a house for you. Here's the key. And they go to this house in Haifa. They're Polish Holocaust survivors. And they see that the house was lived in very recently. I mean, it's self-evident that people that people left in a hurry recently. There's literally like the China is on the table and they know nothing about the Palestinian experience. Why would they? But at, at, a, at a human gut level, they say no. They say, this evokes too much of our own experience. We will not be complicit in this. And it seems to me, even if they, the people like Heinrich and, and, and Gela Kowalski were a small minority, the fact that there was a minority of people who were willing to do that shows that there was a recognition um, that something fundamentally wrong was being done. And I think if you look, if you, and you can act, the more you look at actually J Jewish and Israeli writing during the Nakba, the more you can find examples of people who were saying, we know that this is fundamentally wrong. Um, and that to me is a kind of a spark that one can try to, to cherish and build upon um, and as a, as a vision. You know of 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 how things can be different, um, and that seems to me ultimately is a is a much more not just a, is a more is a is a is a smarter way, and ultimately is fundamentally the right way to deal with the history of anti-Semitism, and and it goes back to the to where we started, which is that's why it bothers me so much that we now have this almost industry that's devoted to fighting against anti-Semitism, and in so doing it is essentially perpetrating anti-Palestinian bigotry because it's basically saying, if you challenge the denial of basic Palestinian rights, if you call for equality, therefore you are an anti-Semite. Um, and one of the things that I've often puzzled about, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about Nizar, is why we don't have more of a discourse in the United States about anti-Palestinianism. I, you know, I'm constantly being questioned about whether Rashida Tlaib, for instance, is an anti-Semitic. Her words are constantly being dissected, right? And yet she's the only member of Congress, as far as I know, who actually supports equality. All of these hundreds of members of Congress who, who, who happily support the denial of basic Palestinian rights, no one ever asks whether they're complicit in anti-Palestinian bigotry. And I, I'm interested in, in why you think it is we don't have that kind of discourse and what it would take to change it. Sure. So, I mean, the, the classical one is that in general, the U.S. is a, is a place that is very pro-Israel. It, it took some time for me to understand where that was coming from. So it wasn't, oh, Americans just suck and they just love Israel and they are a superpower. And of course, a superpower like the Romans are going to think of their interests and they're not going to think in, 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 in egalitarian or ethical uh, terms. But when I engaged the U.S. and got to learn more, I realized that the, the huge uh, you know, footprint that Jews have in the United States, whether in the arts or in the uh, in academia, right? So the Jew is very familiar to the American, right? The Arab is not. The Arab is, by definition, foreign. In the, on top of the racism that was anti-Arab racism even before 9/11, right? There is a very good uh, documentary, Real Arabs by Shaheen, right? Uh, so the the depiction of the Arab as foreign, as barbarian, as different, on top of the fact that Jews were part and parcel of the American experience, the bagel, the, 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 the jokes in, in New York and so on and so forth, right? So uh, 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 the Jew is domestic, the Arab, the Palestinian is foreign, right? So it, they, people don't feel it, right? They don't know Palestinians. They know far more Jews are familiar more with Jewish stories than other. Now, where is that important? And that's why there is no anti, uh, you know, anti, uh, anti uh, or outrage at anti-Palestinian uh, um, rhetoric or even anti-Arab uh, uh, action. Now, 
what I see even more problematic on uh, uh, decapitating our capacity to fight anti-Semitism is precisely if you're going to stifle dissent and censor people and deny them the, uh, the freedom of expression in expressing their anti-Semitic thoughts, right? So that they, they cannot express them. So they think of them and then they act on them without us realizing that there is an anti-Semite amongst us. That just reinforces the idea that the Jews control everything, right? Which is precisely feeds anti-Semitism. But if they are treated equally like yes. any other, it wouldn't be a problem. Now, and here it's important to show that there's nothing special about you know, uh, uh, people in the Jewish community taking advantage of that exception, right? It's, it's yes. just as impossible to debate our, uh, the US policy towards Cuba because the Cuban lobby is extremely strong. You cannot talk about corn yeah. because the corn lobby is so strong, right? So there's nothing, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 the protocols of the elders of Zion in it, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. There is anti-Semitism and there are all, all sorts of other uh, isms out there. And if we want to be effective, we need to tackle all of them. And that's why the work of Linda Sarsour and, uh, um, and, and you know, rabbis for peace and others who are working together, right? Who are differentiating we disagree on israel but when it comes to uh, our citizenship here in the us we are all equal and we're going to fight anti-semitism as much as fighting uh, anti uh, or fighting islamophobia and what have you. that is the kind of work that we need to be doing okay so i'm going to jump in um we're almost at the hour so thank you both to both of our speakers um so i've been monitoring the chat and I just want to say to everybody very clearly that um, you don't have to agree. You don't have to agree with either of these speakers um, that many opinions are valid. This is a very difficult conversation and this is one aspect of the conversation. And so we're, we offered this as an opportunity to hear voices that are not commonly offered in mainstream. Um, and we hope that you are able to gather something from it and learn from it. Um, but please don't think that you have to agree. You also don't have to agree in order to support combatants for peace. I mean, part of um, part of our work is that this is a wide tent, that this is the ability to hear other opinions, to hear opinions that are different from your own and to honor them and respect them. And I think some of the most beautiful stories coming out of um, Israel and Palestine really have been the stories of, um, of I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of so many, I'm, that's why I'm stopping, my brain, is, my brain is going. But I'll give an example, I'll give one example that I think ties into this chat. So one of our activists, Osama Elawat, he, um, before COVID, he was very active in building playgrounds in Bedouin communities. That was his, that was his project. He built five or six playgrounds. It was, he was very absorbed. Every, everything was a playground. We built many playgrounds over the course of about a year or two. Um, and he said at one of the playgrounds, he went up to the little kids and he whispered to them. He whispered to the eldest girl who was about 12 years old. And he said, do you know who these people are? And remember, these are combatants for peace activists. And she looked at him and she said, of, of course, they're international. And he said, no, they're Jews. And she was so frightened that she ran to all the other children and they hid. And then combatants for peace, we came back and we came back and we came back and slowly the kids came out and um, by the end of building that playground, um, the children and the activists had created this incredible bond, incredible bond. And so going back into that community, for that community now, those children don't associate, oh, Jews are scary, Jews are soldiers, I hate them. They associate, these are my friends, they helped me build a playground. So I feel like this is one example of like, how do you overcome like, because hatred, bigotry, it's not something that is formed when we're born. It's something we learn. So how do we teach ourselves? How do we teach our children to unlearn it? How do we teach our children to find compassion? How do we teach our children to meet the other, to hear their stories, to challenge themselves um, and to, to really find that place of love instead of hate in their hearts? And so I do hope that this discussion helped you um, come to some understanding and that it was helpful for you. Um, 
And I, I would love to say thank you. Thank you so much for coming. And um, yeah, if you can support Combatants for Peace and the work we're doing on the ground to overcome hate, to overcome anti-Semitism, to overcome anti-Palestinian bias, it would be deeply appreciated because that's where it's one thing to talk about the work. It's another thing to do it. And your support really goes a long way in um, helping communities in Israel and Palestine to overcome hate. So thank you. I'm going to put uh, Peter's because I forgot I was nervous. I'm putting Peter's blog in the chat. So please, if you want to follow him and his blog, it is now in the chat. Please do so. And I'm also going to put um, the donate link to Combatants for Peace so that you can support our work if you so choose um, and make an active difference to overcoming hate, truly overcoming hate of both sides on the ground. Um, and just to be clear, we are an anti-racism NGO. This is what we do. So if you want to support anti-racism work, condemning anti-Semitism, condemning anti-Palestinian bias, please do because um, this is where the work gets done. So thank you. And yes, a recording will be sent out to all registrants in the morning. Thank you for having us. Thank you to both of our speakers.